All right, good morning, friends. It's um, Thursday, so, uh, man, I, I wake up Thursdays ready to rock and roll because I know that when I finish my task at the Stone Company, um, I got the weekend, and so uh, looking forward to that and uh, everything that, that takes place uh, in that. I love Fridays. I love Fridays when we travel, when we do things like that. I also like Fridays uh, when we don't because it gives me a chance to deep dive into some studies, and right now I'm, I'm Man, I'm wearing myself out really just doing a lot of research and studying in several different areas uh, for lots of things that are that are going on. Uh, last night I'm reading Church Fathers, uh, Asubius and uh, Josephus and uh, historians, I should say, not necessarily Church Fathers. Uh, <clears throat> just kind of deep diving into an understanding of their perspective of of how the scriptures came into their hands and and. Um, it's easy to, you know, you hear people talk about how we got our Bible and they'll give you a five minute presentation. It's too watered down. It makes it sound like men chose it. Like, oh, I just men sat down and decided we're going to take this one, this one, this, and we're going to not, we're going to kick these 40 books out. Um, and it's not true. And so, uh, anyway, it's just, it's just interesting to, to, I like to know my sources. When I speak something, I like to know that it's truth and that it's, I've, I've studied it out. So spent the evening yesterday doing that. We'll probably continue that line as well as, um, uh, what that means. If, if the word of God is the word of God, then, uh, our lives have to bend to that. I don't, the world doesn't have to, but our life has to bend to to that. And we already know it's the word. I just, but I think it's important that people understand, because uh, even in, in Christian circles, I think we, we, we take the word for granted and we've allowed people to reinterpret it any way they want to, to where now it's kind of like a magic book. You just open it up and if you feel like it should say this, then you find a verse that helps you feel that. And it's a terrible way of, of, uh, of study these days, but such is where we are. So anyway, enough of that. I'm not sure why I told you that other than that's just kind of what's going on in our world. And so um, we'll see what kind of trouble we get into this weekend. We're heading to uh, Nashville Saturday. Uh, one of my young grandsons, Noah, uh, it's his birthday yesterday, but we're going to celebrate it Saturday. So can't wait to do that. And uh, just see what happens. All right. So let's jump into this text that <laughs> I thought it would have taken like, you know, 20 minutes to cover. And right now, so far, it's taken us two days and um, and it will take us one more to kind of work our way through it. Uh, so we're looking at Paul's letter to uh, the Colossians. And uh, it's kind of an I don't mean that in a derogatory way, kind of an insignificant city uh, in <coughs> Asia Minor. Asia Minor is a, is, is that's Turkey. But it's a hotbed. Uh, two times the scripture says that's where Satan has his throne. Um, it is where uh, the the beast will come up out of the sea. Um, all, all of those things and references are in that area. It is where the seven churches in the book of the Revelation are. Uh, so it's often forgotten to kind of keep a focus on what's happening there. Uh, and, and so just for future things and for all sorts of things. But anyway, Colossians is in that area, though it's not a city anymore today, not one that's, that's lived in. Uh, so that's where Paul's writing. He does, he didn't, as far as we know, personally go there, although because we can't find it in writings doesn't mean he didn't. Paul, I think Paul went everywhere, right? Um, and so, but, uh, but his friend Epaphras, who, whether he met him in prison, because he calls himself a fellow prisoner of the Lord when he writes the personal letter to Philemon, um, or not, um, he either uh, was at one time, or the fact that he was in prison. Uh, you know, some you hear guys say, hey, we, you know, we, we're, we're uh, fellow prisoners. That doesn't mean they served in this, or they, they've spent their, their time in, in the same place jail could have simply meant two different areas. You hear that a lot, even in our day. So whatever that is, uh, Paphras is a good man who's given a good report about the Colossian church. I think he had some issues uh, with some Gnosticism that was creeping in, although he may not have called it that at that time. Uh, and so he wanted Paul's help. And so Paul writes this letter, and uh, it's a powerful letter to the church, and it covers so many things that we're going to see as we walk through it. Today, we're going to finish up looking at really uh, a lot of little word studies that jump out at you in this passage. And so let me just kind of give us, by review, we saw that the gospel is a faith issue. It's received by faith. I won't, I won't go over that. You can listen to that. That was Monday, uh, or Tuesday, rather. And then we also saw... 
that it results in love, that, that the goal of, of our faith in Christ is to, is to redeem of the love in us, right? So that God shed his love abroad in us through the spirit whom he gave to us. So what we lost at the fall, we regain in our faith in Christ. In our faith in Christ, uh, we are given a hope. The, the inheritance that of, a, of an earth that we would rule and reign over, which was Adam and Eve had, that was lost, we will regain that. Uh, we regain an incorruptible body, which they had until the fall. Uh, we'll also uh, reclaim and, and, and our love for others. The sin entered the world, and in Adam and Eve, when he said uh, they were naked and not ashamed, and then they ate of the fruit, and they knew their nakedness, that's a term for the idea of, of self-absorption, right? You, you, if, you, if you're so in love with someone else, you're really not even work focused about your own life because you're so saturated with love for them. But if selfishness ever creeps in, and it becomes about you, that's what happens. And that's why they were naked, not ashamed, because their focus wasn't on themselves. It was true humility focused on the other. Sin enters the picture, and it turns our attention to ourselves, and that's where every sin comes from. And so the gospel is meant to eradicate that so that we must die to self, right? So that we must uh, we must love as he loved. And so that's the whole deal. We looked at that uh, a couple of days ago as well. So just so we're kind of clear on what's going on. And then it rests in hope. And, and we talked about the hope laid up in heaven and all of those things, because that's what he speaks of here in this text is he's just reminding them of this glorious gospel. And so today we're going to finish this thing up. So let's read it to get to a verse 6, which is new for us, and then we'll, we'll just uh, look at some thoughts about that, and then <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll move on from this section tomorrow and, and launch into the new. But he says this, We all, always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Paul, like, man, when, you're, when your name comes to mind and we start praying for you, is, our, we just have this grateful heart. And, and so it's powerful to think about that, how, how just a, an image of someone can either produce a little bit of flinching, oh man, or this, wow, I miss them, right? There's that kind of a thing. We want to be those kind of people, right? The ones that people go, man, I am so grateful. Every time your name comes to mind, it just gives me happy thoughts, right? That's, that's what you're looking for. So, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints, right? That's what happens. Faith came, and then there was just this love that just begins to ooze out of them. And, and you can see that. What, what was the motivation of that? Because they understood the brotherhood of Christ and what that means. Because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. Listen, all those who believers that you are with today, that are true Christ followers, and you, you know you, this is this life isn't all there is for us, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna see you in heaven, whether I get there before you or you before me. There will come a time when we will all settle in there and we'll all be there together. That's why we love each other because it's not just necessarily for this life only. Uh, man, we we're, we're gonna be spending eternity together. Just let those thoughts sink in. Let's don't just read the scriptures and 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 you know hear it, but not really let it flesh itself out in us. And so he says, this hope is reserved in heaven for you. You've already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you, right? So you, you've already heard of all of that. It, it's in the gospel, right? That's the gospel includes the hope of eternal life, right? I mean, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, right? It's in the gospel. <clears throat> and so you can't separate that out. Uh, that's why Paul uh, in, in uh, Corinthians, you know, says, man, if, if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then we're, we're all to be pitied because that means we won't be raised from the dead. That means this is all there is. But Paul says, but that's not true. Now, so then we get to verse six. Here's what he says. And so the thing is, what we hear is that the gospel is reaching the world. Listen to what he says. <clears throat> uh, that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. So <clears throat> what do we learn from that? Paul's like, man, you, listen, Paul's traveled the world already. He hadn't been to Spain yet, but he will. Uh, when he gets released, he'll do one more fourth missionary journey, and he's going to make his way to Spain. That's based on evidence of uh, historians that have written about, about Paul. 
Uh, but he's seen a lot of it. And what he's saying is everywhere I go, man, I see, man, I just see the, the gospel bearing fruit. <clears throat> you know, so it it's reaching the world. This this is what it's doing. And, and know that. And what he said, the gospel will re, re, preach to the whole world and then the end will come. Um, Romans 1.8 says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because the news of your faith is being reported all over the world. So he's, he's right and saying, hey man, the whole world is here in the fact that, the, that you Romans are coming to Christ. <clears throat> um, and so what we see there is it's, it is growing. It is growing. It is still growing today, not at the rate that we would like it to. <clears throat> uh, let me give you, Gordon Cronwell, uh, Theological Seminary, did a little research. Uh, it was 2019. Uh, <clears throat> but listen to, listen to some of the statistics that they speak about. So that, Because I, I, I always am concerned, it feels like, that uh, Christianity is kind of being pushed to, to, to the margins, and I think it is. But listen to these statistics. <clears throat> it's growing faster than the population. People are coming to Christ at a faster rate than our than people are bearing children. Uh, the rate, <clears throat> it's not a great rate, 1.27%, right? That's 2.5 billion uh, people uh, are, are believers in Christ. Uh, in the world, it's 7.7 billion, and we're growing at a rate of 1.2 percent. So it's it's almost neck and neck, <clears throat> but we the, but Christianity is growing in this population. So that's good news. The bad news is uh, the Muslims are kicking our tail. Uh, 1.95 percent of of the world is turning to Christ and has done. Uh, that's the rate of growth of Islam. It's a smaller group of people to begin with, so they have We are still the largest uh, group of, of people in in the world as far as religion is concerned. But that's taking into a very broad perspective. Uh, within that realm, the Pentecostals. Now, that's anybody that uh, that's mainline Christianity that has brought in uh, all of the charismatic gifts, right? You, I mean, you know what we're talking about. They're Pentecostals in that sense. Uh, and evangelicals, those are those that, that are being trashed right now uh, as though we're the problem with all of the church. Um, and, and, but evangelical simply means that you, are, you believe the tenets of the faith, um, that, and that's what you and me are, I would assume. Uh, it's possible that you're something else, but for, the, for that is where that is. They're still growing the fastest. In that realm, 2.26% uh, of this growth is happening through the Pentecostal rank. They're doing a great job of getting the gospel out and about in the world. The evangelicals is 2.19%. That's up from 2017. So just re in the recent last, you know, three, four years, we're seeing an increase in the gospel uh, going forth and hitting its mark. Uh, now, where's it growing the fastest? Uh, Europe's growing at a rate of 0.04%. That's called post-Christian society. Uh, they, they, this very minority that, of people who would be attending churches, uh, even less that actually believe in Jesus and the resurrection and all of those things, or it's meaningful in their life at all. Uh, North America is 056 we're not doing too well ourselves, us in Canada. Uh, you get to Latin America, 1.18% down in Mexico, Central America, all of that area, uh, South America, uh, and those Latin American areas. It's growing at a 1.18%. Uh, Asia, 1.89%. That's where we're seeing real growth, over in Asia. It's just the gospel is making its mark, and you see it. Every time that I have been over there, you see more and more of that, and and it's and the reports I'm hearing now is the same. But Africa, 2.89%, double what's happening in Asia. The gospel is growing uh, in Africa. That ought to excite us, just to know, because when the gospel is preached to the whole world, then the end will come. Now, Paul thought that it had reached his day and age when he said, hey, the whole world has heard the gospel. Well, it hasn't because that the Lord will come when that happens. But to, to, but to realize that it's growing is kind of an amazing thing. Um, the, the unevangelized, I'm going to give you, I know these are statistics, but I just think it's important that we understand these things. The unevangelized, um, over half haven't heard the gospel of Christ. In the 1900s, it was 54.3%. More than half of the world had not heard the gospel. 
2019, 28.4% have not heard the gospel. Right now, that's taking into account people being born and people dying, but 28%. So almost three-fourths of the world has heard the gospel of Christ. It's growing. When you think about it, it came from a little uh, area that's, I mean, you can hardly see on a map the gospel was birthed um, and in, in, in Jerusalem. And from that vantage point, it has reached the whole world. It's amazing what took place. Um, so anyway, I, I got more statistics, but that's I was just doing that for my own self and self edification. But so what's it doing, man? It's reaching the world. That's what he says. You have heard already uh, about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world. Now, so what does it do? What does the gospel do? Well, I mean, it it um, we receive it by faith. Uh, it results in love. Uh, we 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 see hope. It, that, that is birthed out of that. It's reaching the world. It's also producing fruit, right? It's 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 producing uh, it's fruit in the sense of love, in the sense of gifts. You see it. It has an effect. Uh, it's producing fruit and growing all over the world. Now, if we just thought in terms of of how, uh, listen, you, you, the world can say what they want to, but the people, the breadbasket of the world, the people who are feeding the poor and the hungry, it's the believers. That's who's doing. You look at every nonprofit that's doing that kind of work. Overwhelming majority is driven by the gospel of Christ, our love for people. That's who's feeding the world. That's who's digging the wells. Just go do your own research. It, it's not the atheist. It's not the agnostic. It's not even the climate change folk that are doing that. It's the believers in Christ who have set these things up to say, this is what we're going to do. Don't let people downplay you as a believer because of these things. The gospel is growing and it's bearing fruit. You're seeing it and you're seeing what takes place. Uh, to me, the most the most uh, remarkable deal is, is what happened in, in India. Thomas, doubting Thomas, that's where he made his way. When he gets up about halfway, there's a road called the Road to Calcutta. It goes from Mumbai to Calcutta, and Nagpur is right in the center of it. Uh, everything from that, that's where he was martyred. That's as far as he reached. But you can see visibly the difference in the in the landscape from what happened south to what happened north. You, you can see industry, all because... Believers bring with them so much other things that, that the fruit of that is there. Uh, the more north you get, the more hostile it is. That's where all the deaths and things like that are taking place in India right now. And the Hindus are brutal uh, and, and brutally destroying believers up there. Uh, but it's bearing fruit. And it should be bearing fruit here. We should be known in our town as the people uh, who are who are loving the least of these, right? It, it should be us. We should be really going crazy about that, and and I think we are in some sense. But we can do better. Personally, you and me should be bearing fruit. People should know the difference because our attitude, our countenance is different. Our attitude is upbeat. Our our and hope filled and uh, and solidly moral and and uh, practicing of the golden rule. That's all fruit. That's what it looks like. Uh, and, and then he goes on and he says this uh, in, in verse 7, uh, just as it has among you since the day you heard of it and came to truly appreciate God's grace, right? That, that's, that's how it's motivated. When, when you understand the grace of God, you can't, you can't help but be humble and loving and fruit bearing. You can't. The reason why the church today isn't where it is is because we think we're pretty good. We, when we see, when we talk about grace, we've watered it down. Until you know that you were deserving of wrath and that you're a dirty, rotten, stinking little sinner, nobody likes to say that anymore because that's negativity and everything. But if we don't know that's where we came from, we can't appreciate what Christ did. And so we kind of think that Christ really didn't do that much for us. He just kind of forgave us of our sins. Ooh, we're grateful for that. But you don't realize a total radicalization that happened in your life when you came to Christ. All things pass away. Behold, all things become new. That's great. Grace isn't tolerance. That's what, that's what the church thinks grace is today. It's just tolerance. So we're going to be gracious to people. What that translates to in most churches is we're not going to talk to anybody about their sin. That, that has nothing to do with, with being gracious or, or whatever. That, that, that's deception in my book. Uh, <clears throat> but grace, grace means that, that I, have, I have experienced this lavish forgiveness and, and uh, fatherhood 
an inheritance from the king of kings, and I didn't deserve a thing. I didn't do anything to get it. When you have received that, you can't help but love others. Our lack of teaching that is why we don't see the church bearing more fruit than it should. Um, and then he says this in verse 8, and I'll let you go. Um, and he has told us, oh, you learned this from Epaphras, verse 7. Our dearly beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ to you on your behalf. And he has told us about your love in the spirit. There is that dying to self that takes place. Listen, the only love we have is what flows from the spirit. Self-love, our, our fleshly, brotherly love, it's a good thing. But it's not, it's not the end all. It's an agape love. It's a love that abandons. I'm not loving you because it's it's a brotherly thing to do. I'm not loving you because it, you're going to give me back something. I'm loving you because Christ in me compels me to do that. That's the spirit of Christ. And that spirit of Christ in us, that is our greatest need. To, let, to, to see Christ as Lord of our life. To let the spirit of Christ really be in, in full measure, overflowing in us. That's the gospel. That's uh, that's what we, we finished it today. We're going to move on tomorrow. But man, Lord bless you guys. Uh, I can't wait to see you in the morning. And I hope you have a great day and that you wear Christ uh, in a way that honors him today. All right, Lord bless you. See you soon.